So the slides aren't up. You knew that? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I got That's right. I'm good. There we go. <laughs> All right. Bob, did you want to say anything before we get started? Sure. I'm sorry I was late joining, oh, but I'm glad I, I guess I got here just in time anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was having some technical issues. So. <laughs> no uh, worries. I want to really thank Nina McHale and uh, Lisa Traditi for making uh, this talk today possible uh, for our Colorado Cochrane Center, but also for all of the work that they've been doing tirelessly for uh, Lisa for many, many, many years, and Nina for, um, in many ways, to make our Colorado uh, Center a success here. So they're, they're two excellent librarians that I hope um, all of our colleagues across the nation have uh, similar um, medical information specialists at their, at their uh, disposal. But I feel that we're very, very fortunate here. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll let you take it away, Nina and Lisa. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. So um, I'm Lisa Traditi, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Strauss Health Sciences Library, and Nina. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nina McHale. I'm the Head of Education and Research, also at the Strauss Health Sciences Library, which is, we were just reminiscing about that lovely building uh, behind Lisa on her camera that we used to be able to go to. <laughs> and um, so um, just a little history, the um, at our campus, which is the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, um, the Bob Delavalle, who you've just met, um, is the director of our Rocky Mountain um, Cochrane U.S. affiliate. Oh, I, I have to make sure I get the language right. Um, and um, Patricia Hain, and I'm not sure if Patricia's on the call, um, is the co-director, and they reached out to us. Um, back when they started um, even just expressing interest in, in the affiliate. And since then, we'll, and we'll talk about what that result has been, but we were excited to engage with them in, in whatever way we could. And um, some of that has been serving on the steering committee with them. Um, it's also been uh, basically helping to, to uh, think up speakers and, and do the logistics for this very seminar series that we're doing. Um, but we wondered, um, Nina and I did, what are the rest of you who are um, affiliated in some way? What's happening at the other affiliate centers and the Cochrane Review Groups and Satellite Review Groups in the United States? And so we sent out a survey. And so what we're gonna talk about today is the results so far of that survey. It's still open and we'll be putting the link for the survey in the chat. Um, and, um, and then we'll also be doing our final presentation of the results in a poster for the Medical Library Association virtual conference in May. And we'll be sharing a link to our poster once it's finished on the Rocky Mountain U.S. Cochrane affiliate website. And we'll put that link in too. It's also in our slides. But first, we want to know who you are. So we, I believe, have a poll yeah. ready for you. Nina's going to administer. Um, we might lose the slides for a second here. Oh, no, here we go. I, got, I wasn't sure if I would get the Zoom controls or not. So, all righty. So what we're asking here, there, there are four options. We basically want to know if you're a librarian or if you are faculty or a director or co-director um, on your campus. And then we want to know if you are coming from someplace that has an, a Cochrane Affiliate Review Group or satellite review group location. So there's four options. Um, and there's also a, we didn't want to put other because that sounded mean. So I just, I said, are you someone else? <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds. And then share the results. All righty. 
So here we go. Here, I'll share the results. Looks like most of us are librarians. And everybody seeing the results here? Yeah. Yay, my first poll. I did it. Um, <laughs> so it looks like <laughs> out of the participants here, we've got three folks who are librarians at a Cochrane affiliate review group satellite or review group location. Uh, 26 of us are librarians in health sciences or medical positions, um, not at a Cochrane site. Um, we've got one person, I bet that's Bob, who's a director or co-director um, or faculty at a, not a librarian at a Cochrane site, and no one who is faculty, that last one, and one person who's someone else. All right, so I will stop sharing that, and we'll go on to the next slide here. All right, Lisa, take it away. Right, so thanks for doing the poll. It helps to know if we're talking to the choir or to the congregation here. And so, um, but just a, a little background for those of you who don't know about the Cochrane US network. Um, it formally launched in 2019. And um, there's a link here on the slide if you wanna learn more about that. But the idea was to, before that, there was a US center, Cochrane Center, um, that was housed at, at Johns Hopkins. and um, and Cochrane overall decided to go with a different approach. And, um, and so this is the result. And we'll talk about what this, the affiliate places are in a minute. But this also includes some review groups and fields and satellite review groups um, in addition to the affiliates. And so um, there are some of those and then there's We've also included a link with more about the Cochrane Geographic groups. And yes, we will share links in the, in the chat too. And this is being recorded too, and the slides will be available later on. Um, but the, the US network is made up of the, the Cochrane US West Associate Center, three Cochrane Review groups, um, that produce systematic reviews in fertility regulation, neonatal health, and urologic conditions. Three U.S. satellites of Cochrane Review Groups that focus on eyes and vision, pregnancy and childbirth, and musculoskeletal disease. One field specializing in complementary medicine, and then the 15 affiliate institutions. And um, so that's what you're seeing um, here. Well, go back a slide first. Um, these are the affiliate networks. And so you can see those of us who are at academic libraries that, you know, there are a lot of health sciences libraries affiliated with these institutions. Some of the affiliate groups we don't think have libraries or librarians, but we're not entirely sure. So that's part of what we're just trying to discover too. And then if you'll go forward, Nina, uh, the review groups and satellite review groups um, most of them are engaged, we believe, with the library or have some kind of grant supported um, money for offsetting a librarian's salary. Um, but again, that's what we're trying to discover. So our collaboration here at the Rocky Mountain U.S. affiliate, as I mentioned, we, we built on an already existing very strong relationship with uh, Bob and with others on our campus, um, the librarians immediately. So before Nina uh, joined the steering committee, Lillian Hoffecker, who many of you know, um, who worked at our library for many years and she retired last November. And so Nina stepped in um, and has been a wonderful addition to the steering committee and as well as to our library in the past few years. And um, so it's been great to be part of that discussion to, to help think about what does the affiliate want to achieve overall. Um, and it's been wonderful for us to have a voice at that table. Um, the main project for the affiliate and that we've worked on, as, as I've mentioned, is the suggestions for the seminar topics. And this isn't the first time that our librarians have, have presented um, Christy Piper and Kristen DeSanto presented last year or the year before about systematic review work and how we've been engaged in that. Uh, we mostly, when I say we, that means Nina provides uh, logistics support for registration and 
I help with the advertising, we record the seminars and then host the affiliate website um, where all the recordings and links to the calendar live on our LiveCal um, website, in addition to using Live Guides and YouTube. Um, and you can see the link to the affiliate um, for our live, the live guide for our affiliate here. Um, and so this has been a really great collaboration for us. Um, and again, we wanted to learn what was going on elsewhere and what else we could think about doing. So our future collaborations, we're looking forward to um, working with uh, Tin Jang Lee, Lee, who is on our campus now. She was at Johns Hopkins and she's moved to our campus. And with her is coming the Eyes and Vision Satellite Review Group. He currently has uh, funding, grant funding, to support librarians to do the systematic review work for Eyes and Vision Satellite Group, but they're still at Johns Hopkins, uh, the librarians there. So we're open to future collaborations with Chan Jing and her group, but right now, A, her funding still is there with those librarians, but also Nina and her team are just overwhelmed right now with the work already of performing advanced literature searches and doing systematic reviews. In fact, they halted taking on new uh, reviews this past year. They're just ready to catch up with everybody that was on their wait list, and, and, but they still haven't started taking new requests yet. And I'm sure many of you on, on the line on this call can relate to that. Um, because of both COVID and then we, as I mentioned, Lillian retired, there was another person who left. So they were down two people, a little over two people during this time. So, and, and as you'll see, that's a theme that's gonna be repeated <laughs> in some of what we've heard from you and other librarians. Um, so we wondered, how, how are the other librarians engaging with their U.S. Cochrane affiliated groups? And I'm gonna let Nina take it from here and talk about what we've heard so far. Sure, thank you. All right, so we launched this survey um, and here I'll, I can, I think I still have it copied and pasted here. Maybe I can share it in the chat without losing our slides. Um, I'll hold off until the end, just because I think I think we'll get through this pretty quickly, and I don't want to disrupt the <laughs> the slide I'll share. Start, I'll start posting. Oh, if you, yeah, if you can too, Lisa, that would be great. Yeah, since I'm advancing the slides. Okay, so we um, did what librarians often do. We wanted to find things out. We uh, we wrote a survey and to ask our colleagues what they were doing. This was targeted at the people. We started with just the people at those 15 affiliates, um, but then at the suggestion of the Cochrane US Network Director, um, we broaden that to include the um, the review groups and the satellite review group sites as well. We opened it on March 23rd and we're leaving it open because as Lisa mentioned, we're uh, going to be put, putting together a poster for MLA uh, in May for this. So if you are someone at one of those affiliates or review group locations, you're still welcome to fill this out. The link is here and Lisa mentioned she'd share it in the chat as well. Um, as of April 12th, when we reviewed the responses, we'd received 12 responses from 10 institutions. So two people from uh, two, uh, two people from the same campus twice <laughs> replied. And of that breakdown of all those organizations that we showed you, uh, we had responses from two of the satellite review groups and eight of the affiliates. And that includes us too. So Anschutz plus seven others. Um, so let's see. So we, the questions we asked were, um, are you engaged? Yes or no. And then there was some skip logic based on whether you responded yes or no. Uh, so the nine folks that responded that they were actively engaged with their affiliate or uh, re review group folks. Um, this was an open text question. So you could, I, I believe the text was describe the nature of your uh, collaboration with your group. Um, two folks said they attended meetings. Eight people said that they work on reviews, systematic reviews and, and um, evidence synthesis projects. Uh, four said that they taught or presented. And one, <clears throat> that's us, <laughs> said that we uh, support this uh, seminar series that we're all attending today. Uh, so on the right side of the screen, um, 
for those people who responded that they were not currently engaged with their Cochrane groups, uh, these, these were the options. Uh, again, the engaged was, was a free text response. This, we, we provided some suggested responses, and then there was another with uh, write-in space if people wanted to provide their own free text. Um, so the next slide is a breakdown of what those three not engaged responses were. Uh, so one person indicated that they hadn't been invited. Uh, and two other, so that was the first response. And then there were two of that, two identical responses of that second bullet. The second and third person said it was lack of time and capacity and gaps in knowledge. Um, no one suggested lack of interest or opportunity, which is not surprising as librarians. <clears throat> that's what we want to do is get engaged and collaborate and help. And uh, other was not selected. And so there was no uh, free text written in either at that point. Okay, um, I wanted to share. So, getting back to the folks, the nine folks who said that they were engaged, these were uh, these are some quotes and some common themes in the free text responses. The final survey question again, reference librarians, right? Is there anything else you'd like to tell us? Is there anything else we can help you with? Um, so, the final question was just that. Uh, one person said, and, and I've had the blue bold or sort of words that stood out for me as I was analyzing these responses. Um, there's so much opportunity for collaboration. Uh, as librarians, we make meaningful contributions. <clears throat> Excuse me, allergies going on over here. To the work of the Cochrane affiliations, we need identification. So who, who we are, how we can help. Uh, furthermore, we can share our experiences, knowledges, knowledge, skills, concerns, or questions among the group members. And finally, um, someone shared exactly, I mean, it was something I could have written. Uh, it was concern about capacity is, yes, we wanna do this. Yes, we're so glad you reached out to us, um, but we're in, as Lisa mentioned, we're in my department, we're sort of struggling with the, the daily ins and outs of running our, our search service that we make available to the whole campus. And we're just sort of hesitant about what we could take on without additional staff uh, collaborating with the Cochrane units on our campus. So again, like as Lisa mentioned, I'm sure a lot that everyone can relate with there. Um, so what we're doing as far as next steps is we'd like to reach out to folks. And one of the questions in the survey was, would you be interested in uh, a Cochrane US Network Librarians group? And um, we'll reach out to the folks who did. And if even if you are not at one of those affiliate or um, review group sites, you can still let us know if you'd like to be in sort of it, it wouldn't be a um, <laughs> it wouldn't be an exclusive group just limited to the organizations that were on those couple of slides at the beginning. Uh, if you're interested, you can let us know. Um, the way we sort of saw this playing out would be through regular virtual meetings. Uh, topics could just be. Um, support, group support, um, providing peer reviews of searches. Uh, we could talk about training, how to close the skill gaps that a couple of the survey respondents identified. And we're open to, you know, what else? What else could we talk about? What else would benefit librarians who are engaged in Cochrane related work, whether at affiliates or review group sites or not? Um, we also would encourage, um, again, we have this fantastic relationship with Bob De La Valle and Patricia Hine, and now Chen Jing Lee, since she's arrived on our campus. Um, they reached out to us and recognized the, all the, the light blue words on the previous slide that we could uh, collaborate on those things. And um, Lisa, do you want to comment on the, the funding piece here? Yeah, I think it's it's important for us and and for folks like Bob and Patricia and Chen Jing to be advocating with their um, peers, the other affiliate directors, to ask for to include funding to support librarian salaries or to offset salaries so that we can because our other work doesn't go away mm -hmm. as we add this work. And we're all of us, I think, across healthcare are famous for trying to do more with the same amount of money or the same number of hours in the day. And the only way we're going to be successful at this is increasing librarian hours by adding more librarians to do the work. And so, you know, working in partnership with our affiliate directors, I think, is so key to ensure that there's money to support the work that everyone is doing. I know, you know, I'm sure Bob is working, you know, 48 hour days right now, um, trying to run his clinical practice and the affiliate. And we shouldn't be asking that of ourselves or each other. 
So how do we ensure that there's funding there? Um, where else? And yes, um, Lisa Barrow is also now on our campus and she's looking to start an evidence synthesis center on campus, which will take even more librarian time to support. So short of cloning, how are we gonna make this happen? And um, as an administrator, it's something, it, it, you know, from the library point of view, like we can, we can support this, you just have to give us funding and we'll, we'll get the librarians to do the work um, if we have the money. Yeah. One of the other things that came up in the survey too is sort of the model of there's librarians in the library and some of these units have their own researchers or their own informationists or informationist scientists. We're not advocating necessarily for one or the other, but again, it would be nice for all of us to, <laughs> to work in coordination so that again, since like Lisa said, we all tend to do, <laughs> do too much with what we have um, to, to sort of optimize that relationship. We're, we don't advocate that it be the library necessarily that supports it or that, you know, that there can't be librarians elsewhere on campus, just sort of the open communication so that we're all working towards the same goal. Yeah, kind of like the chicken in every pod. I want a librarian in every research group. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so also, as we mentioned, we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll wait to see if we get uh, some more responses to that survey. Um, and we'll be presenting a poster at the Medical Library Association B conference here uh, next month coming up. Um, and we also included, um, uh, Lisa, did you want to go over these? We also included some, some pointers for, this is stuff that Bob already knows, and it sounds like he's the only <laughs> director here. Um, but we wanted to include, these are sort of talking points as to, maybe for those organizations where uh, they weren't they didn't have they weren't invited necessarily these are sort of talking points as to why you would want a librarian on your team lisa do you want to highlight some of these or go yeah i think you know we could all write chapter and verse on these reasons but if you need talking points as you're reaching out or connecting with the folks on your campus um, or for those i don't know everyone who's on the call we've had a few people join but if you are um, engaged from the clinician researcher side of your Cochrane affiliate, how, how would you engage? What should you expect from the information specialists or librarians? But I think for those of us who are librarians, these are all things that we can do. Um, and if we don't have the skill set, that's one of the reasons we want that Nina and I are interested in kind of creating this network and support group of the US librarians. There's already a team of librarians engaged in this work and information specialists that are doing systematic review work that we can engage with through Cochrane. The, um, the, the review, I never get the name right, the Cochrane review coordinators um, that do this work for each of the review groups. But they're very focused on that the explicit uh, requirements of doing a Cochrane systematic review. And I think what Nina and I are interested in is taking a step back to how do you come, become proficient in doing systematic reviews? What is other work you can do if you aren't going to do the systematic reviews? If, if your team already has someone doing that, what are other ways for, for you and your library to be engaged? So, uh, but I think especially in that literature search, that, that is a niche for many of our librarians. Um, but also teaching around critical appraisal and finding the evidence um, that I spent much of my career doing just that um, and not doing actual systematic reviews. But I know a good one when I see one in the literature. And so teaching others how to recognize that, as Bob mentioned in the chat, there is an epidemic of poorly done systematic reviews. And I think many of us in our libraries have had students and others come to us saying, I have a month off and I want to do a systematic review during my research month and we have to try to burst their bubble gently and and help them but then what are the other kinds of reviews they could be doing that contribute to the evidence out in our world and and that they could do well in um, that time frame so that idea of other types of, of reviews and that work and then finally, also just being on the team and having a voice on the team. Um, we've been, um, it's been, it's been great for us to have this wonderful relationship 
with Bob and Patricia and Chen Jing and now with Lisa Farrow coming to our campus. So I think, you know, figuring out just how to be on the team and learn together and support each other um, to be treated as equals in that team has been uh, wonderful for us. And, and so, yeah. Um, other questions, do you all have other ideas about ways that you've been engaged that we're not listing here? Or you've had your librarians engaged that aren't listing here? And I'm gonna go through the chat. Um, so I'm seeing someone's asking, um, and I, let me get my chat bigger so I can see who it is. If anyone subscribes, that's you, Peggy Edwards, is asking if anyone subscribes to the interactive learning tutorials on Cochrane. And we don't at our library. We have the full Cochrane library, but not the interactive tutorials. And so we've been talking about how to get funding for that uh, to make those available. OK. Um, and Bob is saying that I will, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. That sounds like it's Cornish or something. Hi, well, Willis um, <laughs> just spoke on this at our Cochrane Skin and Annual meeting last month, and the talk is on YouTube. So that's, what is that you're referring to? Yeah, so that's in response to um, Peggy Edwards, who's been looking for articles on the epidemic of poor quality systematic reviews. So Hal Williams uh, was the original leader of Cochrane Skin. And he gave a keynote lecture on March 18th um, on the epidemic of systematic reviews of poor quality in dermatology in particular. So uh, I'm sure he would be interested in uh, perhaps talking to you, uh, Peggy, and giving you some uh, more general uh, references. And his talk is on YouTube. I, I bet if you um, Google uh, Hal Williams YouTube, Cochrane Skin, you can uh, get to his talk that was on March 18th. But it, I can it is help on you find that too, Peggy, because I want to go back and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of good talks about yeah. meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Terrific. Because, um, like I said, I've been finding uh, various studies for you know different specific disciplines, you know, skin or you know surgery or whatever but nothing in general so yeah i will take a look at that thank you so much yeah and um i i think you know it might behoove the medical information scientists to think about if they need to put a filter on people who are not registering their their mm -hmm. systematic reviews in prisma and aren't going to um use the checklist for quality performance Amstar mm -hmm. 2 and what they're doing because they're likely not to do a good job if they don't use all of those checks and balances for um, registering a protocol of a systematic review before they get started to show that they've thought about everything properly and that there, are other, there aren't a lot of other people who have done it already. And Howell's talk really did show there's an epidemic, a uh, huge, explosion of very poor quality systematic reviews being published in predatory journals and it's, it's a big problem. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, I would certainly second that, um, you know, idea. And the other thing that I think is a problem is, you know, these poorly done systematic reviews are showing up in PubMed about, yeah, a, a year and a half ago, I came across an article sadly done by a faculty member here um, who said, oh, this is a systematic review. And immediately, you know, I realized there were serious problems. One, she only searched PubMed and Google Scholar. Um, there was no, she was the only reviewer, so there was no blind reviewing in it. She did the searches. I mean, <laughs> I was like, oh dear. So yeah, it, it's a huge problem. So thank you. All of the uh, red yeah, flags, maybe, Peggy. You know, <laughs> ask the National Library of Medicine in some way about indexing, um, you know, uh, that, you know, the article does not include Prisma or has not been registered in Prospero or even Open Science Framework. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it, it's a really worrisome trend. Um, you know, I'm just like, 
well, you published a systematic review on this. Did you? Hmm, you didn't follow standards. Hmm, you're not touching me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an issue for, for my team too, Peggy, because it's like, well, it, it, we, we want to be involved and supportive, but we also want to make sure it's done in the correct way. Because as you're, as you're touching on with this faculty member, it does reflect back on the institution then if we're not, if we're not registering Absolutely. things, if we're not... <laughs> reviewing and blinding and, and doing everything we need to do. And one of the things that we are, uh, Lisa mentioned, we're, we're finally going to uh, reopen our, our searching service this week. One of the things that we've done is we've built in um, a tiered system. And, uh -huh. and I, I've heard different opinions on this at MLA and other places too, with librarians and information specialists about whether or not we should do them for students or with students. Um, and one of the things we're doing to sort of ensure the quality is there we have a tiered structure now so tier uh -huh. one is like a systematic review or equivalent um, evidence synthesis project tier right. two is we write the search for you but then you run it and you get the results and then tier three is uh, more of a consultative for students uh -huh. uh, and with that tier one we have an mou that that makes sure that they have their ducks in the row with all the kinds of things that you and bob were saying is that um because the other issue for us is we would lose a lot of staff time. We would spend 20 hours working on a project that would then evaporate into the ether because either the people involved didn't understand what was required, um, got to the point where they're like, oh, wait, we don't have time to do this, or it, it just sort of fell apart. And it, it, it just was really disheartening for us to put so much time into a project and then have it not come to fruition. So we have a, we have a memorandum of understanding now that aligns all of those things like registering and, and, and spells out the role of what we do and what our expectations are and, and making sure that everyone is in the communication loop. So we're hopeful that that will address some of those kinds of things and, and improve the quality of the, um, the, the projects that we're involved in. Yeah, um, I can relate to all of that. Um, I am in charge of uh, getting our systematic review service going here at Texas Tech. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I run into all of those problems. Um, I, I will look forward to looking at your memorandum of understanding of, I went through the LibGuides for systematic reviews and meta-analysis through most of the medical school mm -hmm. libraries in the country. So I'll look, but I haven't seen yours. So I'm looking forward to that, looking at that. Uh, one thing is that, uh, for students who are uh, requesting to do systematic reviews and, and or meta-analysis, we are requiring that they work with a faculty member. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, that also, you know, runs into problems if the faculty member doesn't know or understand about the standards. So um, right. I've been sending out... <clears throat> um, a uh, document that is a summary of all of the standards from the Institute of Medicine and telling them that they have to agree to follow those standards. Um, and then uh, one of the other things we've just lost, I can uh, understand about, you know, not having enough help. We just lost one of our reference librarians. Mm -hmm. She moved to a different location. And um, so one of, and I'm just overloaded with requests anyway. Uh, one of the things I've just started doing was telling, you know, students who are um, and or residents who are requesting reviews that they have to search Prospero and Open Science Framework and PubMed's clinical queries to see if they can identify, you know, any searches that match that. And then I give them some hints on or some instruction on how to do those searches. But then I tell them that they have to send me copies of their search strategies mm -hmm. so I can see how exhaustive they're, you know, that they've done that. But it does, it has helped cut down the workload a little bit. But I also have discovered that sometimes they use keywords that I wouldn't have thought of. So if that's you know, we'll, uh, we'll see how, if that continues to work well for me. Um, we've just about two weeks ago subscribed to the Cochrane Interactive Learning. Um, so um, they don't really seem to address the, the um, issues about, you know, making sure that this uh, question has not already been answered. Um, but um, so I'm going to, you know, give them feedback about that. But the other thing I'm going to do is, you know, once, you know, we've kind of determined that a study has not been answered uh, this question is then uh, in the first meeting with the team say, okay, uh, we've gotten 
past that part. Now we're going to go on to this part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need to uh, look at this particular module in the Cochrane tutorials. And then you need, the nice thing about the Cochrane interactive tutorials is you, they can do it on their own time. I'm doing the Coursera right now, but you have to do it within their two week, a 10 week cycle and get it done then. Whereas the Cochrane, you can do it as, as you have time. And, but when you finish the module in Cochrane, you can get a certificate of completion. Mm -hmm. So that's something I'm going to say. And then when you're done, please send me the Cochrane, you know, your completion certificate, especially for the students. OK. Yeah. And, and then and then we can proceed. So, you know, so I'm hope those are different ways that I'm hoping to address those issues here. Yeah. We also have a clinical research institute and. I had worked with the director on evidence-based medicine uh, teaching tutorials. He used to be director of surgery and I'm gonna go talk to him and say, this is a huge problem. So this is one, one of the reasons why I want this data. And, I, and you know, when people are doing you know, research, they need to do these Cochrane interactive tutorials and here's why. So anyway, okay. Everything you uh, didn't wanna know about what I'm doing here. <laughs> It's, it's so important though, Peggy, that we share this because I mean, it's, I, I've only been in the medical library circle for a couple of years, but uh -huh. I've gone to all the MLAs and it's it, any, any presentation that you go to about searching, we're all dealing with the same thing. How do we manage yeah. the workflow? Here's this platform we made. Um, how do we deal with students? How do we, and one, one thing that we've thought of in terms of dealing with students is that we know that multiple units on our campus, I just had a consultation with the College of Nursing faculty this morning, um, especially when they're working with PhD level students, uh -huh. um, and in school of medicine also, uh, is find out where they're teaching, evidence synthesis, SRs, meta-analysis, find out where they're doing all this in the curriculum and yeah. do some outreach there. <laughs> because if we can kind of hit everybody at that level, we can set expectations. We'll know what they want the students to be doing. Um, we can help support that through instruction instead of you know, burning ourselves out through one-on-one -on -one consultations exactly. <laughs> over and over. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think we all relate, Peggy, to to exactly all the things that you just said. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm. I've heard different things and realizing that this is not only national, but it's in, it's international because um, there was a, a testimonial uh, in the Cochrane Interactive Tutorials, you know, when just kind of looking at them, just trying to decide if that's what I wanted to do from a librarian in Scotland, okay? And I just, you know, she named all of the issues, you know, that we've just been talking about. Yeah. Um, and, but then of course, the other thing too that I'm running into is, oh, the faculty members are saying, oh, go do a systematic review. And it's like, they think, you know, they're thinking in terms of, oh, go do a PubMed search. <laughs> Oh, right. What does do a clue. systematic review mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have no, they, they just have no clue. And so trying to figure out how to, you know, get faculty to buy into the fact that, look, there's, you know, procedures and, and, you know, problems and etc. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So there's oh, yeah already in, the in the chat. Just want to make sure you all are following that and we'll make sure these that we capture this as part of the recording um, because there's some good stuff here. But just this discussion alone is good, a good reason why we need this network of us to talk to each other and share information. And oh, I agree. Not have everybody recreate the wheel. Yeah, I'm. I I really am all for a librarian network on this. Uh, Peggy, I think you really highlighted a lot of the education that needs to be done to not only students, but to faculty, oh. and that people need to realize that we don't have an unlimited uh, supply of <laughs> medical information specialists to do poor quality searches for bad reviews that will then poison our medical information. Oh, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah. exactly. All the things that Howell's presentation was about. <laughs> <laughs> That's and the well result. trained librarians as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Because there's so much to it. Um, the, the education has to be up there front and center, and uh, those filters have to be in place so that we don't waste your valuable time and the valuable time of all of the medical information specialists. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that makes me feel better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're all on the same page. Yes. Yeah. yeah.
So everyone, what other questions or comments or suggestions do you all have? I'm gonna put the link again to the survey if you haven't filled it out. Oh, sorry, wrong link, let me go back and get it. Um, but I'll put that in the chat again in case you haven't filled it out because we do wanna hear from you. Scroll back up and find it. So I'm you can put things in the chat or go ahead, Teresa. Sorry, um, so I'm a non-systematic review librarian in Omaha and I cheer on my well-trained colleagues every day. I don't <laughs> think any of them are here with me. So I'm listening to you all and taking notes back. Um, is, is your survey of use to somebody that's not affiliated with the Rocky Mountain? Is there anybody that we might be able to affiliate with? Uh, I don't know if my colleagues know about Cochrane US. That's a good question. That we were aiming at the people, you know, the official US Cochrane affiliated groups. We might need to do a secondary survey at some point or part of our focus. I think so, group. yeah. Yeah, people who are interested but not yet with an affiliated group because there are ways you can be engaged with Cochrane without having an affiliate. Um, sure. Even if, you know, around the just making sure like your folks that you're working with doing systematic reviews know how to work with one of the review groups if they want their review to be officially in Cochrane um, and their protocol to be published in Cochrane and that kind of thing. So yes, and everything you all are talking about, I've heard my colleagues talking about uh, as far as not enough time and the, the, the when a student contacts you and says, I'd like to do a systematic review and you have to bust their bubble. And, yeah. um, uh, and also striving to teach, this is where I fit in, uh, teach them what a, uh, what a qual high quality systematic review looks like or a quality systematic review. <laughs> Peggy, I wouldn't worry about busting bubbles. I can remember when I was a, a student and undergraduate at UCLA and I liked the professor who taught Indian history. And I went to his office hours. I said, tell me a little bit about Indian history. He said, well, have you read my book yet? <laughs> I said, oh, that's a good place to start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, I uh, just had the experience of, you know, working with a student who's in the beginning of doing a systematic review and uh, you know, just kind of trying to bring her up to snuff and then send her the link for the Cochrane Interactive Tutorials. And, but I also you know, pushed it by saying, you know, if, if you do these and you have copies of the certificates, you, know, you can add that to your CV, that'll make you look really good. So I kind of marketed it to her that way. And she emailed me back immediately. Oh, thank you, this is going to help a lot because she was just really at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, but I, one, one of the other problems I have, I'm liaison to the internal medicine department. We have a lot of residents here from other countries and you know, they're competing with each other. Um, you know, they wanna get into prestigious uh, fellowships, etc. You know, probably they want you know to make sure they have their green cards renewed and so on and so forth. Um, but so I think that that's going to be the harder thing. Um, but I also have known the residency director for well over 25 years. I actually taught him to search mini Medline back in the day when library information systems was out, and so I think I may have an in with him and talking to him to say, are you aware this is happening and here are the problems? So, you know, but I realize that in real life and the nuances and stuff, I mean, I can't control it. None of us are going to be able to control this. All we can do is just, you know, get the information out there. But um, as also, I think one of the things I'm really glad we have the Cochrane tutorials for is that now that we have it, um, should somebody question the institution or somebody affiliated with the institution, we can say, well, this is available to everyone, you know, our students, faculty, staff, residents, um, and, and then determine whether or not they went through those tutorials. So, you know, the ethics as well as, you know, I, I, the legalities of it is not something that really, uh, particularly good motivation, but it is there 
and people are are responsible for what they publish. So, you know, I'm hoping that that will kind of help, you know, reflect on the institution that we have these tutorials. Anyway, that's all. <laughs> and, um, uh, Peggy, I can't remember if it was you. I think it was another commenter mentioned about, you know, how do we, how do we become affiliated with one of these groups? Bob, is there any, any reason that a group of librarians at an institution couldn't instigate this if they found a faculty counterpart? No, um, you certainly couldn't. I, I can tell you my experience with Cochrane is both as a um, review group um, editor and as a center director. And I've found that most Cochrane enterprises have been much more direct for a review group. So I'm the dermatology uh, editor for Cochrane. And in that realm, the uh, Cochrane skin has drastically shrunk the number of systematic reviews that they're taking on. And they're using people who are much more trained and qualified to do uh, many fewer reviews that are much more complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been the major change. So. Uh, when I started 20 years ago, you could volunteer for the Cochrane and start a systematic review and get the training and sort of build the airplane as you flew it. <laughs> now you have to be a pilot with the pilot's license before they'll uh, let you take over the airplane. So um, it, with regard to centers, centers could start um, uh, you know, medical information science uh, cores and uh, they can look for funding for that. One of the problems with Cochrane is the funding is not readily available for building infrastructure. The US uh, grant system is very hypothesis driven. So <laughs> best to have a hypothesis that you're testing rather than uh, a building of the infrastructure for, for testing hypotheses. Lisa, is there anything else in the chat? Um, so people are sharing links to their systematic review live guides and their, oh, their links for people are, there's a discussion around sharing information about other types of reviews and uh, several folks have, uh, you know, said that they, they offer a resource that describes other types of reviews. So we're asking everyone to share those. Okay, uh, great. Because I think, yeah, I agree with that, that you know, that conversation with people who are interested in doing this work to help them understand you don't have to do a full-blown systematic review. Here are other types of reviews that would add to the body of evidence that are doable with fewer authors and, you know, it won't take you a year or so to do mm -hmm. them <laughs> or months and months anyway. Um, so I can see uh, Terry Hartman shared the one from McGugan in Nebraska and Jana Lawrence, I, I saw said they, they have something like that too. Uh, yep, she shared their link at Iowa at Hardy. Um, so see, see how powerful all our minds are together. <laughs> all, this, all this information. Um, and Jana, the, the link to your workshop, is this for uh, faculty and students and residents or for librarians? No, for faculty, um, for people wanting to do a systematic review. Okay. And that's one piece we've noticed that we're really missing too, is, is one, one way is to target it through the getting embedded in the curriculum with students. But yeah, we don't have, um, right now we have Lillian made a uh, tutorial before she retired and we have that up. But I think, I think we need to take that, uh, that strategy too of, of developing more for faculty. So I will probably go and look at that. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We don't require that people take the class or anything, mm -hmm. but but it's nice when they do. And I think it also sometimes dissuades people from doing a systematic mm -hmm. review. There's and an element why, of that to ours too. <laughs> that's why we started the class on doing a scoping review was, you know, hoping that some people would realize that what they want is not um, really a systematic review. Right. And that's okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and thanks, Jordan. Jordan's sharing that Cornell Libraries did too last August. Um, and 
Yeah, so that idea, and, and I think the idea of going out to residency programs and, you know, most of them have, um, you know, series of trainings about evidence-based practice, and this would be part, could be part of that, is if you want to contribute to the evidence, um, like how to practice as a clinician, but also how to create and add to the body of evidence in your field. And I know Bob within the dermatology residency program has done a lot of that work too, of helping people understand what, like what's a reasonable expectation in your, in your publishing, your writing and publishing. I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I've stumbled upon for recommending to uh, students lately is the Cochrane has about, has published about 115 systematic reviews in skin. And uh, there are certain journals like the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology that will publish very short editorial summaries of Cochrane reviews called From the Cochrane Library or Cochrane Corner. And what people can do is they can summarize that 100, 200 page systematic review into 500 words or five references and submit that to the journal as a Cochrane Corner or from the Cochrane Library. And a number of different specialties in medicine have these now. So I'm just aware of the ones for dermatology, but I've been pointing uh, students in that direction as opposed, uh, if they want to uh, promote uh, systematic review evidence in their uh, specialty area of interest, if it is skin. One other interesting approach that I, um, I remembered I was going to mention earlier, but we sort of changed direction. Um, there was a presentation. It was one of the medical centers. It was by a librarian from one of the medical centers in the Southeast. I don't remember. And one of the things that they did to encourage students learning about this with the curriculum is that they worked with, um, I think it was a college of nursing and the public health on their campus, is that they taught the SR process. But then I've seen in some of, some of our courses on campus that that part of it is trying to get it published as well but this place the, the the this medical center in the southeast they sort of stopped short of that they're like okay this is what you would do they would still have them do the search so it was more hypothetical and at this point you would publish and if they wanted to they could um and i i think as a student i would feel a little bit better about that too not having and, and in these situations i don't know if actually publishing is like you don't get an a unless it gets published or it gets reviewed I, I, as a student, that would make me nervous. <laughs> and it, it also would sort of, I think, fuel sort of like the inflation of, of just the explosion of maybe not the best quality reviews out there too. But I really like that approach. And it, it was, um, I can't remember if it was an MLA presentation. It, it, was, it was some official sort of, of webinar. And that was how they handled it is they made it sort of the hypothetical in the curriculum of, let's say you were going to do this. This is how you would do the search. This is how you would, you know, walk, walk through that checklist. Uh, steps so that they know how to do it, but then take out sort of the daunting <laughs> aspect of you got to publish when it's when it's as others have said it's it's hard to get everyone on campus on board with what is required to publish and and how we can support that. So eleven fifty. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We're almost at time. Um, and uh, so thank you all for this rich discussion. It's been great. And um, I think there's a lot here that's promising. Um, so as I said, if you haven't filled out our survey, do that. The, um, so I will give a brief shout out for two things. One is some of you know that this library has hosted for five years, the librarian, a librarian's workshop on um, evidence-based practice for aimed at clinical librarians. We've been on hiatus last year and now this year because of the pandemic. But um, what it's allowing uh, Nina to do is she just got accepted to the Research Training Institute that MLA funds. And um, her, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about your project or if you feel like you're still in- Sure, yeah, I can give the, the 30 second synopsis because you mentioned you had another thing too, right? <laughs> Well, that was my second thing. Oh, that was the second thing. Okay, I just wanted to see how much time I had. So basically my, my RTI proposal was 
Um, it was sort of based on my own personal experience of I've been, I, I don't like to admit this to myself yet, but I've been an academic librarian for 20 years this summer. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, but again, I, I, all the places I've worked have had at least allied health, nursing, some health sciences component. Um, when I arrived here in fall 2017, it's, it was my first job at a purely health sciences uh, center library. And I needed training. I needed to learn about evidence-based practice. Um, and I sympathize with the other person who said that they, you know, are in awe of the people who do SRs. I, I manage the team of the people who do SRs. I have never done one myself. <laughs> um, so I get that too. But my experience was I've got a lot of librarian experience. I need to know the health sciences stuff. And immediately it was, okay, um, working with Lisa, it was, I'll do our institute the following summer, um, try to get, and I, I'm still, this is part of the problem. I'm still trying to get, in three and a half years, I have not been able to uh, successfully get the lottery uh, at, <laughs> at the University of Michigan for, for doing SRs, which is part of the reason I haven't done them yet. So the focus is if, um, if these are things that we need to learn, who's doing the training, how and why, I'm intimately familiar with the logistics of what it takes for us to run our evidence-based institute, which is um, using some of my staff to be faculty, uh, but we also have to hire. We have to hire folks from different institutions to come and teach these groups. They're all very high demand, like the Ann Arbor SR1. Um, they're high demand. They're very intensive at, to the location that's that where it's being held. It's, it's very stressful in my department when we have this, but everyone's on board and does it because it's our way of sort of giving back. Um, so my basic question is, is this kind of sustainable? Um, do we need to, or how do we make this sustainable rather? If people are, we know that there's demand for this kind of training and there's multiple ways to get it. Is there something like within MLA or as an organization that we could do to, um, to help promote that and, and make sure that everyone is getting the training to be able to answer and address all the issues that we've just brought up in the, in the past 59 minutes. <laughs> um, I'd just like to add to uh, your thoughts on that, Nina. I think the one problem with MLA is, uh, well, two problems. They, they charge quite a bit mm -hmm. of money for those things. And then also, you know, after the pandemic, you know, there's a lot of money that would be required to get to MLA. So I'm right. thinking perhaps maybe through the regional um, you know, mm -hmm. like South, ours is South Central, yours is Mid-Continental. Yeah, through chapters. You know, yeah. Maybe the regional NNLM um, libraries, you know, could offer something as well. So just, yeah. yeah. And most of these trainings head. actually aren't through MLA. We get MLA credit for them, but they're sponsored by local libraries. Like ours is mm -hmm. hosted here, but the tutors are from all over the place. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. Yeah. But they're still expensive because it's expensive to put them on. Yeah. So, you know, there's that issue. But and yeah. yeah, there's there's equity around training too of, you know, what if I can't travel to Denver to do this? What if what if I it's hard for me to get on an airplane or yeah. 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 But we need to stop. We're we're at, at noon. But thank you all. Thank you. Great discussion. Thanks everyone.